Tracking is one of the most important features for any visual effects work. It doesn't always have to be a really complicated camera tracking. Even something as simple as a one-point track can allow you to do some pretty cool things. For example, I have here this little dot on my finger and um, you can use that to attach um, a particle system or smoke or a little image or what well, I don't know, anything you like. So that can be already quite cool. So let's get started and see how we can track that. So if you want to do some tracking in Blender, of course, first you have to import the footage. So let's first have a look at the files. So in this folder here, you can see I have the movie file, uh, which I have recorded with uh, a Canon DSLR, the Canon 550D, and that records to H.264 movie files. So you can import that in Blender, but it can be a little bit problematic depending on which version you use. It also depends on the FFmpeg implementation. So, well, currently it does work for me. So I will import this movie file. But since with movie files, you always have to do with time codes, with uh, codecs and stuff like that. Sometimes it can be easier to first convert your footage into an image sequence. And that is what I have done too. So I've converted that to a sequence of TGA files. TGA files are, as you can see, rather big. So this is HD 1920 by 1080, and that creates almost eight megabytes per file. But TGA are easy to read by Blender and there is no compression. If you would encode to a JPEG sequence, then most certainly you would lose some quality. But especially with any compositing or tracking, every pixel counts. So you want to get the best quality as possible. And depending on the camera and on the original footage, um, it can also make sense to encode to an EXR or a DPX sequence. And that is also something that you will probably receive when you are working on a film scan that is usually uh, scanned to a DPX image sequence. But anyway, in some cases, image sequences can be easier to deal with because there are no time codes and no codecs and stuff like that. So that are the two things that you can use. Let's go to Blender. So there are several places where you can import videos in Blender. And of course, one thing that you already probably know is the video sequence editor. So here you can import movies and you can also play them back but this is not useful for tracking. So for tracking, we have a different kind of editor, which is also new since Blender version 2.61. And you can find the editor, which is called the movie clip editor, of course, here in the menu. So in the default layout, usually I just switch to the movie clip editor. And here you can now import the footage. And I will do both I will import the movie file and I will import the image sequence just to show you the difference. So I press on open and then browse to the folder with my footage. So there we go. We have the movie file and the image sequence. So let's first just import the image sequence by clicking on the first frame and then on open clip. So that will now import this whole thing and you can by holding down the control key and the middle mouse button, you can zoom in, zoom out, uh, just with the middle mouse button, uh, move your footage, just as you would an image in the image editor. So this is the normal navigation in Blender. Um, you can use the timeline to scrub forward and backward. And you will notice that the default length of 250 frames is of course not enough for this sequence. So first we can set the end frame to the last frame. So that would be here at frame 881. So here, and to set this as an end frame, you can just press E with your mouse in the timeline. So, or you can just type in the number here. So one to 881, that is the length of our sequence. And if you want to play back here in the movie clip editor, you can just hit Alt A for playback. All right, so you will notice that we have this green bar, this playback here with the number of the frame. 
and you have this purple bar here and this slowly fills up with purple color. Now that is the RAM cache filling up and I have set my RAM maximum to, I don't know, eight gigabytes or so. But by default, the RAM or the mem cache is set to 128 megabytes, which is not very much. And that is, of course, something very important when you are dealing with uh, movies. You want to play them fluidly, you would play them fast. So you should set it to all the RAM that you have available. So you can set that in the user preferences. So when you go here, then in the system settings, you can go here to the sequencer area and here you can set the memory cache limit which is set to actually 10 gigabytes right now for me, but the default setting is 128. And that is not very much. And usually you will have more. I mean, it can be that you only have one gigabyte of RAM or two, but when you're doing tracking and if you're serious about that, then you should get as much memory as you can get. All right, and you can see that with just 128 megabytes, there's really not much that we can keep here in our memory. So that is always a pretty slow playback. So of course, everything that is inside the RAM will play back pretty fast, but everything that will have to be loaded from the hard drive can be slower, especially when you are using image sequences, then it can be slower. If you're using movie files, then also depending on the system, it can be faster. All right, but in any case, let's set this back to everything you can. In my case, I have 16 gigabytes of memory on my system, so I want to set it to um, maybe two times uh, four gigabyte. So um, I'm really bad at math, so I have to calculate here in Blender's, um, you know, number field, which is pretty cool because you can easily uh, calculate stuff like that here. So 10 gigabytes of RAM I can address here with Blender. So if I hit playback again, Alt A, then now it will be much faster and I can uh, load much more images here in my RAM. So that is the way that you can deal with image sequences here in Blender, but um, depending on your system and on your Blender version, you can also use movie files. So I just delete the link to that and click on open again and then browse to my folder and then just load this movie file. So this also loads pretty fast and it's a pretty good playback. Um, the thing is on OS 10, which is my system, just a few days ago, I had very bad performance with movie files, especially if they are encoded with H.264. There I had very bad playback because Blender had been using the QuickTime uh, library from my system, but the implementation has been rather bad. So now I have switched to FFmpeg import, which is much better. So actually now I have a decent performance here. So for the rest of this DVD, I will use the movie files directly without exporting to image sequence before. All right, but now that is clear, I hope. So let's start tracking. Now, the first thing is, um, speaking of all the RAM and all this image sequence, if I want to track my finger here, I don't need to keep all these frames in the RAM because my finger is just visible from frame 375. So I don't need the first 374 frames. So in my timeline, I just press S here for start frame or just type in the number here. So now I don't need to have all the other frames in the RAM. So that can also help to increase the performance just in case you don't have that much memory. So until here, E for end frame. And that is now the sequence where we will do the tracking. And since we don't need the timeline or the properties currently, we can go full screen with shift space bar to better concentrate here on the movie clip editor. Now you notice that we have this panel on the left and on the right. So here on the left, we have the tool shelf that you can toggle with T, just like as in the 3D viewport. And also here on the right, there is the properties panel that you can toggle with N. 
And of course, in the properties panel, you have, well, the properties of the display settings, the properties of the camera, of the tracking and uh, other things. And also here on the left, there are tools that you can use to track features in your footage. And just like any other editor in Blender, you have the header down here, where you can also access some um, view properties, uh, some clip settings and so on. Then over here you have this menu where you can choose the active clip. And if I click on this button, I could switch from tracking into dot .mov to the TGA sequence that we had loaded before. Now please note that this is not the path to the file, that is just the title. So I could also just name that intro and it would still be the current path. If you want to change the path of your footage, maybe to exchange the movie file or if you have lost the path or any other things like that. So if you want to change the path to that data block, then you can do that here in the properties in the footage settings. So here you can reload by clicking on that button or navigate to a different folder and load uh, a new file or just replace the link. Okay, so that is that. Then you have this menu here where you can switch between the different tracking modes. So this is currently set to tracking, which is the default mode, but you can also go to reconstruction and distortion. But this is something that we will do later. So let's stay in the tracking mode and now finally start tracking. So I drag the slider here until one of the first frames here where we can see the point on my finger, maybe three, eight, four. This is the frame where you can see this point pretty good. And now to track this point automatically, we will have to add a marker. Now adding a marker can be done here with this menu, add marker and move. So if I press this button and move the mouse over here, then you can see we have this little square on the mouse and I can place this marker now on the finger by just pressing the left mouse button. So click here and you can see that over here you have this little track panel where you can see the preview of your track. So that is exactly the thing that you see within this square. So everything that is here inside of the square will be displayed in the track panel. So these are the pixels that Blender will try to follow when you start tracking. Now, if you want to start tracking, then you go one panel down. So we could just as well collapse this panel and now go to the next one, which is the track panel. And here with the arrows, you can start tracking either by tracking the whole sequence or by doing it frame by frame. So if I click here, it will try to follow this point just for the next frame. And you can see that it has failed. And you can see that it has failed because this track panel is now red. And of course, because the square didn't move at all. So if tracking would have been successful, this field would have moved with this dark point. Now, the reason that the tracking has failed is simply because the movement has been too fast the feature has been too blurry and Blender just couldn't follow the movement of this point. Now let's go back one frame just by pressing the left arrow on the keyboard. So this is our start frame and the distance between this point and this one is too big. And that is simply because this feature is on the next frame, not anymore within the search area. Now the search area is something that you don't see yet. Let's go back one frame. So you have this little point here that is called the anchor point. So that is the feature or that is the point that will later then map in the 3D space to your object. So that is the anchor point. This is the pattern area and the pattern area is the thing that you see in the track. Now there's a third area that you don't see here and that is the search area. And you can activate that by going down here in the marker display panel by activating this little checkbox here, the search checkbox. And this will now display the search area. So this is the area within that Blender will search for this pattern. Now, if you go one frame forward, then you can see that this feature here is not within the search area anymore. 
Maybe I can show you that better by using the grease pencil. So I hold down D, the D key, and now I can start drawing with my left mouse button. So this is the search area on frame 384. And on the next frame, this is now mostly outside of this area. So if you want to track that, you would have to increase the size of the search area. And you can do that by dragging on this little triangle down here. And by increasing that, you can make sure that on the next frame, the feature is inside of that area, so Blender will find it. Now, let's see if the search area is now big enough by pressing this button again. And apparently, it's not. So, let me go one frame back and increase the search area even more. And now, Blender has been able to follow this feature. And if you press again, we can now follow and follow and follow and hopefully track the whole sequence. Now, of course, we don't want to do this frame by frame. You can also try to do that automatically. And the automatic tracking is done by this arrow here. So this is just one frame and that would be the whole sequence. Now, when you press this button, Blender will start tracking this feature. But um, since we want to concentrate on the feature and want to stay focused if everything goes right, I want to have this feature always in the center of my frame. Of course, I can show you when I press this button now, Blender will start tracking indeed, but it will leave the frame just because we are zoomed in. Now, of course, we could just zoom out, but then we might not see if everything goes right and if it's tracking exactly the same feature. So instead, what we can do is to activate the option to lock to the selection. So that is over here in the properties, that is this checkbox here, lock to selection. And that will center the marker here and you can see it is locked. And since it is locked, the shortcut is L. So when you press L, then you can activate or deactivate lock to selection. So now with that enabled, when I press this button now, you can see it always stays centered here. So now I can see exactly where, why and when the feature stopped tracking. Right, so let me go one frame back. So, I mean, there's not really a good reason why it stops tracking here, but in any case, it did fail for whatever reason. So now that we have this failed marker here on frame 508, we can inactivate it again by pressing Shift D, D for disabled, and Shift for just shift that behavior, disabled or enabled. So with Shift D, you can enable a track again. So obviously, it is not on the correct feature point. So let's bring it on the correct point again by pressing G, like grab, and then place it here. And with the arrow buttons, you can now compare if everything goes right. And it seems as if we could go a little bit more down. So we could press G again, or we could also simply drag inside of this pattern area up here. So just with your left mouse button, drag here and move it down a bit and then compare if that improves the whole situation. And I believe we can go a little bit more to the left. So like that. And now we can see if that helps. And yes, it does. So we can continue on automatically tracking this feature by pressing that button or by using the shortcut. Now you can see that the shortcut in my case is set to Command T. But that is just because on my system, the default shortcut, which is Control T, for some reason doesn't work. So what I did was to just change the shortcut by right clicking on that button. And then here you can change the shortcut by just pressing the key. All right, but in your case, it's probably control T. So command T to just keep on tracking. And that went pretty fine until frame 649. So I could now press shift D again to enable or disable. But you can also just press G right away. So when you have a disabled marker that is disabled because it failed tracking, you can just bring it back on track and enable it at the same time by pressing G. So it is enabled and you are in grab mode 
and you can place it again here on this point and then command T again to continue on tracking, although in this case that has some problems. Now it could also be that this is just too blurry. Blurry features will always have problems tracking and in that case it can help if you increase the pattern area. So if you drag this little triangle here on the pattern area, you will just increase the size of the pattern area. You can also just press S and if you have only selected the pattern area, it will only scale that. But if the whole marker is selected and you press S, then it will scale pattern area and search area. So in that case, if you're not sure, you can also just drag on this little triangle to just increase the size of the pattern area, like so. Now, um, I could press Command T again, but if I want to go frame by frame, of course, I can also just use this button here or use Alt and right arrow. That is, of course, easier than pressing a button. So Alt right arrow allows you to go forward frame by frame, especially when you have blurry and rather fast footage as this one, at least for this one point, then this can be um, better and safer than doing automatic tracking. And of course, it is much easier than always pressing this button here. Okay, but it, it seems to go pretty fine. So command T again to let it finish automatically. But well, in this case, bad luck because uh, here on the next frame, it is so blurry that there is no way that this can be automatically tracked. Right, so G to grab it and place it on the feature manually. And I believe that the next frames are so blurry and so fast that we have to do some manual work here. So, okay, these go automatic. So I press Alt and right arrow. That goes pretty fine. But at the end, I think there are some very fast frames. So that has to be done by hand. And of course, this is always possible to have, when you have features, I mean, this is not a feature anymore. This is just blur. So if you have blur like that, then you can always rely on manual tracking just by guessing where the feature point might have been so when I look at my fingers, I guess this would be my index finger. So we can bring the feature outside of the frame actually. And then more over here. And thereby we can even track things that is not even in the frame. And by the way, let me quickly disable the grease pencil here just by pressing this button here. So this is now manual tracking, which is a little bit tedious, but since it is only one point, I think it's not that big of a problem. All right, so we have got that. Now there are some frames on the beginning missing. So let's go back to frame 384. Alt left arrow in this case to track backwards and then G to grab and manually move it. Until here. Okay, in these frames, we can disable that by shift D Okay, now Alt A to playback. And since we have locked enabled still, uh, the footage is somehow shaking around. So let me instead press L again so that we disable the lock to selection and that we can focus on our tracking point. All right, and I would say that looks pretty fine. By the way, this blue line and this red line, that is just the path of the marker. And if you want to enable or disable that, then you can do that in the marker display panel, either by just checking this checkbox here or by changing the path length. The maximum is 50. If you just want to see one frame or two frames, you can do that as well but the default of 20 is in most cases pretty fine. 
All right, so that is very simple one point tracking in Blender. And now I will show you what you can do with it. Now to make use of this marker, or actually I should say to make use of this track, because the marker is really just this thing here. That is the marker. But the, the whole result of that, including this red and blue line, that is the track. So when you have tracked a marker, it is referred to as track. And this track has now to be transferred into the 3D viewport. And there are two ways to do that. The first is to go to the reconstruction panel, or you can also just use the reconstruction menu. That's all the same. So because it's just one marker, maybe let's just use the menu down here. So let's go to reconstruction and then activate link empty to track. So click on that. Nothing seems to have happened, but if you now go to the 3D viewport, which you can do by just switching that to 3D view because we are done here, we don't really need that anymore. So just go to the 3D view. Now you can see that you have this marker moving around in space. And if you select the camera and move it around, you will see that the marker now or the empty is now indeed somehow attached to the camera. And since we don't need a 3D camera in space, but just really need the 2D space of the image, uh, we can hit Alt R and Alt G to clear the location and rotation of the camera. And then just move it up along the Z axis, maybe five Blender units. Now we don't need the cube anymore. And if you now look through the camera by hitting zero and then hit Alt A for playback, then you see this empty moving around. Now, of course, it would also be helpful if you could actually see the footage. So let's press N to bring up the properties panel and then activate background images, add an image, and then just for the camera view, and then choose movie clip. And here from the menu, you can select the clip that you want to see. And that, of course, is in our case, the intro. So now we have this empty following the point on my finger. And now we can do all kinds of stuff with that. For example, we can add a particle system. So let me place the 3D cursor here right on this empty by hitting Shift S and then select the third item, cursor to select it, or in short, Shift S 3. So first Shift S and then 3. So that will snap the cursor to this empty. And when you now hit Shift A, you can add a plane, S to scale it down, just like that, maybe even smaller, so that it really is on the fingertip. And then shift select the empty, so that this is now the active object. And now you can press Control P for parent, set parent to object. And now this plane will be following my fingertip. So the empty can already go to another layer because we don't need to see that. So we only need to have the plane. Right, now what's left to do is we have to turn this plane into a particle emitter. So let's go to the particle settings here and then create a new particle system. And when you hit Alt A right now, nothing's happening. So what's that? Even now, nothing's happening. Well, the reason for that is by default, Blender's particle system is set to frame one until frame 200. But since we have um, this clip set to 375 to 757, uh, we have to, of course, match that. So when I look at that, the finger is really just up on frame, where is it? Here, maybe let's say 378. So that is the frame where I want to have the particle system start emitting particles. So I just copy this number by hovering my mouse over this panel and then hitting Control C and then bring my mouse over this number here and press Control V. Well, bad luck, this is now set to 200 because the end frame has to be set first. So let me go back here, Control C over the end frame, then bring that over the end frame of my particle system, Control V, and then do the same thing again. So Control C, 
and control V. So now it will emit particles as you can see, but something looks weird because they are flying away. And the reason for that is the particles react to gravity. So uh, since my plane is here flat on the ground, the particles will just fall down. Now to stop that, you can just turn off gravity. And you can do that for the particle system or for the whole scene. But let's just maybe disable that for this particle system. So scroll down and then in the field weights, you have this gravity setting and just drag it down to zero. And now, well, <laughs> now it's the other direction, but that is because of the emitter setting. And that is here in velocity. Now it is set to normal one. So of course we have to set this to zero as well. And now the particles just stay there where they have been emitted. All right, so far so good. But what I don't like is that this looks so fuzzy and not really like a straight line. So what we can do is to just set it to emit from vertices and then merge everything so that we only have one vertex on our object. But then it is kind of hard to see and hard to select. I mean, it's not bad, but well, there's another way. And that is the way that I want to use. And that is to just turn off random, turn off even distribution and set particles per face to one. So only one particle will be emitted from this one face. All right, now there is one problem and that is the finger moves rather fast. So here, when I go forward, so in this area, the simulation will be kind of bad because since uh, the finger moves so fast, there will be not enough particles between the single points so that it will not look like a straight line. And there is one thing that you can do about that, and that is to enable a particle trail. And you can do that here in render. So when you set the trail count higher than one, there will be additional particles filling up the space between these single points here. Like so. I mean, it looks kind of funny, but that is because we didn't really simulate the whole thing. So this was just the very fast preview. So let's go back to frame 375 here, somewhere here, and now start simulating this whole thing by activating the cache. And to do that a little bit faster, we can activate quick cache, set the cache step to one. And when you now hit Alt A, it will start simulating. And you can see here in the timeline, we have this red line. And that means for every frame, we have a quickly cached um, simulation frame for this particle simulation. All right, so that's it. And since this is now cached, we can quickly scrub forward and backward. Now all that's left to do is to assign a decent material. So in our particle settings, let's go down here to the render buttons and then turn off render emitter because we only want to render the particles, but we don't want to render the plane or the vertices of the plane. So turn that off. And since this is already set to halo, we can leave that. It is also set to material number one. So when we now switch to the material panels, then we can assign on material index one, a new material. So, and now we can enable halo. And when you render that, it looks a little bit weird. So that is much too big. It is just a, a white blob. And to control that, we can make use of these settings here. And the first thing that I want to change is the size. So here I want to set this to 0 0.04 and that looks a little bit more reasonable. And then the next thing I want to change is the background color. I mean, this has nothing to do with the material, but this gray background doesn't look very good. And later I want to just add this on top of our footage. So if that would be gray, that would lead to errors. So I go to the world settings here and then set the horizon color, which is also at the same time the background color, to black, like so. And 
press F12 again to render. And now this is black, this is white. So next thing would be to add color to this material. So let's go back to the material buttons again. And then from here, I want to assign a texture. So with that material selected, I go to the texture buttons and add a new texture, set the type from cloud to blend. And then here we can also choose a nice color. So here in the colors panel, I enable color ramp to get this nice gradient. And then here I want to change that from black and transparent to maybe yellow and alpha value of one. So just increase the brightness to white and then we can choose a nice yellow color here. Maybe that one. And then over here, I will change that from white or actually I would just leave the white, but we'll drag down the alpha value, the transparency to zero. Now, if you enable this button here, you can see the transparency gradient here. And now I go to the mapping and change the mapping from generated to particle strand. Now to actually make use of the alpha, I also enable the checkbox here and then see how that looks like by pressing F12. And yeah, that's nice. Although it is a little bit too bright. So maybe we can change that when we go to the material settings and change the color from white to black and also the alpha value from one to zero so that the alpha values of the texture can override the alpha values of the material. So render again. And now we have a little bit nicer yellowish color here. I mean, it is not perfect, but as a start, it's just fine. Now to render that together with our footage, we have to switch to the compositor. We could also do that with a video sequence editor, but um, since most of the DVD, we will be dealing with tracking and compositing. So let's go to compositing right away. So switch from the default layout to the compositing layout, either by using this menu or when you do the fast way, you can also just press control left arrow or in this case, control right arrow to go back to the default layout. So control left arrow for compositing. Now, currently we don't see anything here, but we will be using the compositing notes to render this uh, light streak on top of the footage. So first thing you do is you have to enable this checkbox here, use notes and also enable backdrop. The backdrop will allow you to have the preview of the composite here in the background of the compositor. So now that we have that set, we can go full screen here so that we have a little bit more space to work with. Right. So now we want to add the light streaks on the footage. So first we need the footage. So hit shift a to add a new input node and then choose movie clip. Movie clip is a new kind of input node that we have since Blender 2.61 and movie clip, of course, well, it is just the movie clip. So you can choose that from here, your intro movie clip, and this will now be inside of this node. And if you want to view that, you have to add the viewer node. So shift a add output in this case, because this will go out of this uh, node socket into the viewer node. So add output viewer. So this is kind of the preview node and you can connect the output of the movie clip with the input from the viewer node. Now it is a little bit too big and I hope it is not too annoying always to see me and my face, but well, I thought it's fun to, to have this uh, finger magic thing. Anyway, if you want to adjust that to the render size, because currently we are rendering not in full HD, but just 50% of that, you can use the scale node. So shift A again to add a distortion node. So add distort scale, and then you can change that the way this node works from relative to just set it to the render size. So everything that is set here in the dimensions resolutions panel will be used here in that node. So drag this node onto this line between the movie clip and the viewer node. And this line will now highlight. And when you let go the left mouse button to 
to drop the scale node here on this line, it will automatically connect and scale down the movie clip. So that is done. So the next thing we can do is to add a mix node to mix the output of our render with the movie clip. And to do that, we can make use first of the render layer. Render layer by default is always everything that is inside your rendering. So you can already see here this little yellow line. That is our rendering. And we can mix that with this output from the scale node by using a mix node. So shift A, then go to color. And here you can find the mix node. And the mix node has three inputs, a factor that we will not use here and two image inputs. So now drag the mix node onto this line and it will automatically connect. But now you will have white color mixed with this image. So the output is just white color. Now to change that, we just drag the output from our render layer or from our rendering into the second input of the mix node. And now we will have just the output of our render layer because mix will just replace what's uh, below currently with a factor of one. That means with 100%. If you drag this down, you will now see the movie clip too. But in this case, I don't want to really replace my movie clip. I just want to add this bright color. So instead of mix, I use add. So switch that from mix to add. And now all the bright colors from our render layer will be added on top of the movie clip. Now I want to do some cleanup here. So I hold down the control key and just cut this connection for now. Later we will have to connect that. But for now, while we are working here, I think it's just a little bit annoying to always have this connection here. So I drag the composite output node, which is very important later, just over here so that we can connect it later. All right, so we have that output. And that is already nice, but I want to improve that a little bit more by adding a glow to that. And adding a glow in this case can be done really easy by using a blur node. So shift A again, and then go to filter and use the blur node. And the thing that I want to blur is of course my light streak here. So I connect the output from that one here with the blur node and connect that to the viewer node. So either just drag out the socket from the blur node into the viewer node, or the faster way would be to just hold down the control and the shift key and then left click the node that you want to connect your viewer node to. So control shift and then click on the blur node and now that is connected and now we can add um, X and Y value, maybe 10 pixels. So now we have this blur of 10 pixels. Now that doesn't look very pretty and that is because the flat blur is not that good. So instead change it to Gaussian or fast Gaussian and that looks much nicer. So now I want to add this blur, this glow onto my result from this add node. And well, since we are adding, I just duplicate this add node with shift D and drop it on this line. So instead of adding this white color, I want to add the output of the blur. And there you go, we have some glowing light streak here. Maybe it's a little bit too bright, so either we turn down the glow or maybe we can also turn down this here so that that is not too bright, but so that we have a little bit more of this glow. Maybe like that. And if you want to, you can also add another blur. Shift D and just blur that once again, but now maybe 100 pixels. Let's see how that looks like. So that is just a subtle blur, a very big blur here. And if you add that on top of this, you have this nice glow around my hand. All right, so I think that's fine for now. And I want to render that. And to render that, we must not forget to connect the output of the last node with the composite 
output node. So that is everything that is here in the composite output will be rendered when you render an animation. So everything that is inside here will be saved into the output directory. So that is what we want to save. And speaking of saving, let's also save the file. And you can do that with F2 or by going to File and then Save As or Command Shift S or Control Shift S or the old shortcut is F2. So Save As and you can see I have already some versions here. So I just press on this little plus sign here to add another increment so that it is now track 05 and I can save this as my Blender file like so. And now we can enter a relative path slash slash create a new directory by typing render and then slash again and this will now when you press on render it will create this directory in your folder where you have the blend file saved which is of course quite handy now before i render i also want to change the resolution maybe not full hd maybe that is not needed that will just blow up the whole file size and um, for this test Maybe it is enough to just use 720p. So in the render presets, I change it from HDTV 1080p to 720p. That will set this to 100% and also to 1280 pixels by 720. So that's fine. And now we can just go here and press on animation and that will render our particle simulation with the composite and the background in the folder here. So click that and this will now take a while and when it's ready we will come back. Okay so in the meantime it has finished rendering and since we have saved the file we can open up a new scene because now somehow we have to combine our rendered images of course with the original footage and sound of course. So to do that the first thing that we have to take care of is the frame rate. So the default scene in Blender is set to 24 frames per second, set here in the dimensions panel. But the footage has been shot with 25 frames per second and it is very important that you match that when you want to put out or if you want to render a video. Before for that composite output we had just rendered an image sequence and in that case it is not that important to have the correct frame rate but as soon as you're dealing with actual video files then you have to take care of the frame rate. So set this to 25 frames per second then you can go to the video sequence editor and load the original file. So here in the video sequence editor in this area we can add the movie again by hitting shift A and then add movie then go to your folder with the footage, then select the video clip and then here down below all these other settings you can set the properties of the strip that you want to create and it would be very handy if it would start actually at frame 1. So switch that from start frame 60 to start frame 1 and also maybe set it to channel 1. Alright, that's fine. Now add movie strip and you can see now we have these two strips sitting at the first frame or at the first channel actually at frame one and that is fine and because we have used the correct frame rate the end of these strips is also lining up. That would not be the case if you would have used the wrong frame rate. Okay but what is that anyway? So the blue strip that is the images of your movie and the green thing that is the sound. Now this area indicates that this is set to frame 1 until frame 250 so that is the default frame range. So if you would play back here with Alt A there okay there you go it will jump back to frame 1 so first we have to set the end frame to 881 just as before our movie clip and now that we have the original file here, we can also replace that with our rendered images. So Shift A again and then add not a movie but images. So add image and then go to the folder where you have rendered your images 
And in my case, that is here in blend files, uh, recording one point track render. And here, unlike in the movie clip editor, you not only have to select the first image of your sequence, you have to select all of them. So press A for all of them. And we can already match the start frame here in the add image strip uh, properties. So we know the first frame is at 375. So we can also set the start frame to 375. And the end frame will hopefully be automatically matched. But just in case it's not, let's set it to 757. Like so. And then add image strip. And it's here. And in theory, we should have a perfect match indeed we have so that's cool but one thing annoys me and that is how this is transitioning between the original and then suddenly there are the particles it would be nice if it would just fade in so that's very easy to do we just go here select our strip with these uh, rendered images and then on the frame where you want to have the full opacity you just keyframe the opacity in the edit strip properties here. So bring the mouse over the opacity and set a keyframe there just by pressing I or by using the right mouse button and then add a keyframe here. Okay, so that is on opacity one. Now go forward a few frames and then set the opacity down to zero. I for keyframe. Now you have this nice fade in, fade out effect. All right, so now Alt A will play back. And you will notice it is not in sync, but you can force Blender to render that synchronized by using the timeline and then setting it from no sync to AV, audio video sync. And it will in between drop some frames just so that it can match the length and the speed. So here it's ready and okay. Here we can just fade out again. So here set opacity keyframe for one. So bring the mouse over that, press I, and then here a few frames forward, drag it down to zero, press I for a keyframe. Then here in the F-curve editor, you will see the curves for this animation. So there we go. Now we can render that as a video. So I just go here and switch that from the F-curve editor to the properties and set it again to 720p like so. Don't forget to set the frame rate back to 25 because this preset has obviously set it back to 24. So make sure that it is really at 25. All right. And then here in the output, choose a folder, maybe any folder on the desktop. So accept it will be rendered to this path. And then of course we want to output not only PNGs. In this case, we want to output a movie file. So switch that from PNG to H264, then go to the encoding panel, choose a preset, AVI is okay, H264, this is everything okay, as you can see here, and then audio codec, choose uh, maybe MP3. Okay, and now everything should be set, so we can press animation and it will render out a movie file. 